All right, and we're here today shooting on the lunch hour with our friend here today, Oliver Scott. How are you doing today, sir? Doing fine. Glad to be here. All right, I'm your host, Malaya Scott, and uh, we'll just get right into it. So, uh, Mr. Scott, um, where are you originally from? I was born in Waco, Texas. Waco, Texas. Uh, what part? Uh, well, actually, in 1954, which makes me 61, we're shooting this. I was born, uh, not in the hospital, in East Waco, on Fowler Lane, to a midwife. Uh, we didn't have health care plans. My mom and dad didn't have health care plans back then. They basically went to a midwife as opposed to a hospital. People who were a bit more affluent than us would go to Providence or Hillcrest Hospital. But I was born in a, in a, in a home on the corner of Fowler Lane, I think, and Golson Road. And I don't even know the lady's name who was the midwife, but uh, it was in East Waco. Okay. No health insurance. <laughs> History repeats yeah, itself. Yes, 1954. So, um, 1954, uh, when were you of, um, of schooling age? Well, um, I started, I think, in 1960. Wow. It was my first grade year, 60-61. I graduated in 72-73. Uh, okay. And so over the 12-year period from 1960-61 uh, uh, to okay. graduating in 73. Did you have any interaction with anyone who was Caucasian in your neighborhood? Did you ever experience racism at a very early age? Well, actually, no. Uh, before integration and mandatory busing, there was minimal interaction for me with white people. Uh, we went to an all-black church. It was a classical Pentecostal church. Uh, the neighborhood I lived in, all African Americans. Uh, schools I went to, all black teachers. When I got into uh, junior high, what we call it, which we call it middle school that uh, now, we had I think there was, may have been one or two white persons on staff at the administrative level, like working in the office. All the teachers or, were black. All the teachers were black. All the students were black. Uh, uh, a Caucasian, maybe like I said, at an administrative offices, maybe a vice principal or a counselor or something, but only like one, maybe two, and this was. By the time I got to middle school, which, you know, things were changing slowly then to where we would interact more. But for the most part, I didn't have any interactions with white people in my early years, all the way up until uh, on an everyday basis, until we got into uh, uh, the year was, I think, 1970, the fall of 1970. I started my sophomore year in high school. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the year mandatory busing was implemented in Waco. Okay. So I had gone through nine years of school, you know, and I was going to my 10th grade year and uh, mandatory busing happened. So uh, it created quite a, quite an upheaval. Quite the stir. Yeah, no quite the stir. Yes, indeed. So tell me this. Did your parents, uh, did they ever, were they able to help you with your school and did they have any, you know, formal education of their own um, during this time? No, my parents, my mother and my father, uh, grew up in a time where there were some African Americans all across the country who had access to education, uh, but my family had not crossed that hurdle yet. My mom and dad never graduated high school. Uh, they did know how to read and write. My dad, I remember as a small child, my dad reading to me uh, hunting stories and Field and Stream and the Outdoorsman, Outdoorsman magazine. And so uh, they could read. He taught the men's class at church in the Bible study class at church. And so they were literate, but didn't have formal educations through high school or college, anything like that. So with homework and stuff, that was minimal. Mostly other siblings who were older would help with that kind of stuff. Understandable. And how many siblings do you have? <laughs> there were 13 children in our home, not all at the same time. They they were born in kind of <laughs> seasonal shifts. <laughs> By the time I grew up and could count, I guess... Uh, there were probably no more than seven or eight of us at home at one time because the older ones had grown up and left the home. And my then, but my mom and dad had 13 children together. I got it. I'm I just the, be complaining yeah. about the, the three people I live with right now. <laughs> Every, I'm the 12th of 13. Oh my God. Yeah. So, uh, do you remember, you know, the first day of school when integration happened? Do you remember any uh, incidents? Yeah, kind of in a general way. Mm -hmm. uh, I I knew it was a very tense time. Uh, tension was in the air because we had never been around uh, white people.
people in mass, mass numbers of us, mass numbers of them, whether they were students or teachers. And so uh, we were being bused from our neighborhoods into uh, white, white neighborhoods, neighborhoods uh -huh. uh, where the, and I guess the justification for it was that their facilities were, their schools were better, the buildings were newer, they had uh, better equipment. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, even though the school that was closed down that I went to was called George Washington Carver, and it went from first grade to 12th grade, they closed it down. That school, when it closed down, I think uh, its last year was 1969. My brother would have been in 12th grade. They started uh, the year he was in first grade. So mm -hmm. that school was 12 years old. So, which is relatively young for a, a, a facility to be closed down. Mm -hmm. But because of mandatory busing, the, uh, the, the building is still there now. They use it. But for mandatory busing, it got shut down. All of the students and the teachers had to be placed. Some teachers actually lost their yeah, jobs. jobs. Uh, but most of them moved into situations in other schools, and some moved out. I don't know exactly what happened with teachers. I know they're... There, there were some conflicts. I know for myself, I was in the high school band. Mm -hmm. uh, this was my second, uh, my third, going into my third year. We would get in the band in eighth grade, and I had done eighth grade and ninth grade. The tenth grade year, they integrated. And so we went out to this this uh, white school, and uh, the band now, our band director was Mr. Lee. They had a band director whose name I don't remember, but the construct for us being in the band now was Mr. Lee was his associate or his assistant. And Mr. Lee was a, a, a probably a lot better band director, better musician. He played multiple instruments. He had taken our high school band. I didn't go. I was a little young, but I was looking forward to it. He'd taken our band to competitions and won national competitions with our little, little band from Waco, Texas, going to Canada and won grand prizes out of the country. And so we had a, a great tradition of marching band that with integration came, when it, when it came, our award-winning band director was playing second fiddle to a guy who had done little to nothing in the field that, uh, on the scale that our, our instructor had, but he became the assistant band director. And, and, and you know, as students, our response was uh, to that. Uh, many, not all, uh, but many of us who, who were angered by it and really just didn't know how to function in that context actually got out of band. That was the last time I was in the high school band. I got out of the high school band in the 10th grade because of, in my mind, I didn't want to be under this guy because I, you know, I wanted to be under Mr. Lee. I wanted Mr. Lee to be my band director. I didn't stop playing my instrument. I actually went on to be a musician and that become a way of earning my living. But I got out of the band. I wish I had stayed in now in hindsight, but I got out because I was frustrated with, wow, who is this guy that my band instructor is now his assistant? And it was it was awkward that first year, but Mr. Lee went along with it. Of course, you know he was a man; right. he had to earn money, and so. Right. But that was one of the things that really started to reshape, probably in some ways, where I would go. Um, did you feel any like when you would be in class? Did you feel like your your white counterparts? Did you feel like they maybe resented your presence? Uh, yeah, to some degree. Uh, another another example was the basketball team. I played basketball in eighth and ninth grade. Got out there, I started playing. Uh, but the coach, again, the white coach was the head coach. The black coach became his assistant. And so most of the white guys played. And the black guys were as good, if not better. I ended up getting off the band, uh, getting off the basketball team, and deciding, you know, I want to be a musician anyway. And then... And both of those situ situations were a bit awkward for me. But I got off the basketball team. So that happened in athletics. It happened in music where kids, some kids adjusted better than others. And those kids who's probably whose parents were a bit more educated and had more insight on how to adapt to those situations, their kids probably, you know, adapted better and, and got into the situation. Eventually, I got it together mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and got through high school, <laughs> graduated. And went on to go on to college and do some other things. But uh, it was a very uh, uh, a turbulent time for us to adjust being around people other than our own. Now, I wanted to touch on this before we, uh, we go. Um, you expressed to me in, um, earlier in the week that you had a desire to go to TSU when you were younger. Could you tell me about that? And well, how you feel about your kids going to TSU now? Well, briefly... Uh, it was the tradition. If you were in the high school band, you were good. And I was like third chair in my first year. So I was good at playing trombone. Mm -hmm. There were only two guys in front of me. The tradition was that uh, you would 
if you were good, you would get a scholarship if you were really good. You know, it was pretty, it was a given. If you're good in your audition, you can get a scholarship. And that's what I, that's what I had in my, my sights. I wanted to go to Texas Southern and, uh, and go to college and be in the band there. Uh, after mandatory, mandatory busing and immigration, of course, I got out the band. That was off the table for me. And so even though I wanted to go to Texas Southern, I put it on my transcript. The council was never counseled with us when we went out to the white schools. Because the first year we were at one school, very next year, we got bused to a different school mm -hmm. um, for my last two years of high school. So the first year was one school, the next two years was a different school. And the counselors didn't really kind of counsel us. If you didn't know about what you were going to do and have a plan, and your parents were astute about how to get you transitioned from high school to college, you, uh, you were just kind of on your own. And I, I didn't know what to do, so I just graduated, and I was just glad I'd gotten out of high school. But I, I wanted to do Texas Southern, and it's a great thing now. Ironically, after all these years, I have... Uh, Three children at Texas Southern. One is going to graduate in May, and a couple of others who are coming up the ranks. And so I'm excited about my kids. I didn't get to go to Texas Southern, but my kids get to go, and I, I'm, I'm really excited about that. All right, well, thank you, one and all, for joining us today on the Lunch Hour with Mr. Oliver Scott. And uh, be sure to be looking for his 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 band, Cat Band, going to be out here touring New Year's Eve. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All right, thank you, Mr. Scott. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Do 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 do.